Well, it's uh, still a pleasure to be here at the conference. Uh, and I'm only sorry we can't be all together in Santiago, but maybe next year we can lift our Pisco Sours and uh, toast the end of this pandemic. Um, do you advance, please? Next slide, please. Yes. Well, as we all know, the, the crisis began with a global convulsion in financial markets. Uh, capital account volumes exploded. I'll show you some pictures. But strong policy actions by advanced economies and counter cyclical actions by emerging and developing economies pulled us back from the brink of disaster. Right now, the global financial cycle is expansive, but it may turn when central banks tighten and emerging markets will be especially vulnerable. Uh, a theme of what I want to say today is that the world economy cannot remain reliant on exceptional policy action. Uh, financial resilience needs strengthening. Next slide, please. Um, just to give some perspective, uh, these are the, the updated Lane and Malesi Ferretti data on uh, stocks of nominal uh, debts and liabilities, the average relative to GDP. And you can see the run up to the global financial crisis, but then slower growth afterwards and um, basically stasis for the emerging and developing economies. So financial integration remains high but it hasn't ballooned in recent years as it did in the uh, 2000s. Next slide, please. Uh, this chart indicates some of the strains by looking at flows in markets. Um, these numbers are the um, <clears throat> gross uh, sales and purchases by US residents of foreign and US assets. And uh, I have on the right some of the relevant identities, but they're an indication of the strain in financial markets at the time of the crisis. If you look at the spring of 2020 and afterwards, uh, these flows reached somewhere above $6 trillion per month. Now, US GDP, uh, and these are, these are um, basically long-term portfolio capital transactions. So they're a partial measure of international financial flows. US GDP is about 2 trillion per month. So we saw a level of financial transactions more than three times the level of GDP. So the fact that there were strains in financial markets is not surprising. Next slide. Um, for emerging markets, uh, these data on portfolio flows indicate the sharp reversal that took place in March of 2020, followed by, by a very sharp uh, inflow surge into emerging markets for a sample of countries. Next slide, please. Uh, for Chile, these numbers look like this. The, uh, the uh, sudden stop was not as bad as for many emerging markets in March of 2020, but um, there have been huge inflows since then. Next slide, please. Um, the arsenal of tools deployed uh, is well known, but just to run through it, uh, emerging markets were able to use interest rate cuts, QE, FX intervention, looser reserve requirements, liquidity operations, uh, macro prudential easing, enhancements to market functioning, and there were also fiscal responses, which were facilitated by low global interest rates, and low domestic rates. Some US measures helped, such as Fed foreign exchange swaps for selected countries. Next slide, please. Um, is this a pivot point for emerging market macroeconomics? Some hold that this, uh, this uh, response uh, uh, which was not pro-cyclical as sometimes in the past, uh, shows that we're in a brave new world. I think we should be cautious. Emerging markets started in a relatively strong cyclical position. They are building on a uh, 
track record of inflation credibility that has been accumulated over years, as well as uh, human capital accumulation in central banks, particularly uh, uh, a growth in policymaker skill and experience. And also they surfed on the incredibly aggressive monetary and fiscal actions in advanced economies. Next slide, please. Uh, Chile's response is indicative of what was true in many emerging market countries. You can see here how the peso, even as it was depreciating sharply uh, in the initial stage of the crisis, was accompanied by very sharp interest rate cuts by the central bank. Uh, subsequently, the peso recovered uh, very significantly partially on the strength of global commodity markets. Uh, next. Um, the pandemic, in addition, leaves a legacy of stretched public finances. And there could be scarring that makes this worse over time. Um, the obvious reasons for this fiscal <coughs> uh, deterioration are um, support that was needed, health expenditures, revenues that fell in emerging markets, even as a percent of GDP. And coming up, there will be more supply chain driven inflation pressures. Next slide. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, there are other risks. Much of the government debt that was issued, uh, the new government debt resides in emerging market banking systems. Uh, less on central bank balance sheets than is true in advanced economies, raising a potential doom loop. Credit easing measures <coughs> and macro pru measures um, could uh, lead to a need for harsher trade-offs later, the need for more tightening when interest rates rise. Next slide, please. Um, uh, one back, sorry, you went too far. Back please, oh, no, you didn't, sorry, good. Um, in addition, the disease uh, situation remains uh, unresolved in many countries. Uh, vaccine distribution has been very uneven and um, there is a threat that uh, uh, some vaccines that have been used extensively in emerging markets, for example, Sinovac, Sinopharm, will not be as effective against new variants that may emerge. Next slide, please. Looking at the fiscal picture, uh, this chart shows um, the uh, advanced economies on the right-hand axis, emerging markets on the left. You can see that emerging market debt levels are um, uh, lower than in advanced countries but rose significantly. Um, uh, they're particularly high in Latin America due to uh, some of Chile's larger neighbors. Next slide, please. Uh, but if you look at percent increases in government debt GDP ratios, they're pretty comparable everywhere, having risen the most actually in emerging and developing Europe. So these uh, debt burdens, I would argue, uh, the marginal debt burdens are probably comparable. And historically, emerging markets have been more vulnerable when debt burdens rise. Next slide, please. Uh, Chile is in a relatively favorable fiscal position, but uh, you can still see that between 2019 and the projected 2021 outcome, its, uh, it's debt to GDP ratio rose by something like uh, like 20%. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned the global financial cycle uh, at the very beginning. I believe we're now in an expansive phase. And uh, this important strand of research indicates that um, if the global financial cycle turns, we should expect trouble. Uh, in this chart, I show the uh, relationship between the Miranda, Agrippino, and Ray measure of the global financial cycle and uh, real GDP growth in emerging and developing economies. I've annualized their data, but you can see the striking close relationship. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the Miranda Agrippino Ray measure is um, based on asset and commodity prices. There's been continuing research. Um, some notable paper, papers are listed here. And they basically support the, uh, the uh, findings of uh, 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 Sylvia and, and Ellen while um, adding some uh, additional insights about capital flows and commodity prices. Next slide, please. Um, the global financial cycle, as has been emphasized by uh, Yun Shin and others, is closely related to the dollar's exchange rate. Um, here you can see the uh, nominal effective dollar index graphed against the monthly Miranda Agrippino and Ray index. The negative association is striking. Next chart, please. Uh, dollar appreciation uh, tends to be negative for global trade. Uh, growth, as you can see uh, in this correlation chart between real trade volume growth and nominal dollar appreciation. Next chart, please. And furthermore, uh, the dollar is strongly and negatively related to commodity prices, uh, as this chart indicates. Now, um, next, next slide, please. If all um, shocks were monetary and we lived in a flexible price world, um, an appreciation of the dollar would be accompanied by a fall in proportion in dollar commodity prices and all emerging market currencies would appreciate in proportion to uh, the dollar. And um, the, the real price of commodities relative to GDP in emerging markets would, would not change. But this is not what happens in practice. First of all, when major uh, advanced economy currencies um, depreciate against the dollar, emerging market currencies often uh, appreciate less because of fear of floating. But more importantly, the price of commodities tends to fall much more than the, uh, the, uh, the uh, price of uh, 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 than the dollar appreciates. Actually, if you could return to the previous slide, if you just compare these two axes uh, where um, the dollar is on the, uh, the um, uh, right and commodities are on the left, you can see that they're on sharply different scales. Uh, this, is, this is just for the IMF's index of overall prices. Uh, two slides forward, please. Um, if we actually look at the relationship <coughs> between real domestic commodity prices and the dollar, um, it's strongly, <coughs> sorry, negative. Uh, across a range of emerging markets. So here are just basically the first six that I picked and um, you can see what these numbers look like. So when the dollar strengthens, this is bad news for real commodity incomes in emerging markets. Next slide, please. Uh, this indicates the relationship for Chile in particular. Next slide, please. So, what are we worried about? Um, <clears throat> there's a great debate in the US uh, and elsewhere, but especially in the US about inflation, what to do about it. Uh, Chair Powell was just renominated uh, this morning. Uh, if the Fed gets behind the curve and has to abruptly tighten, this will really stress emerging market public finances and possibly lead to crises with dollar appreciation being a potent channel. The current expansive stage of the global financial cycle will, will end. And a number of studies, uh, including an important one by Shebnam at Jackson Hole, documents how US tightening will raise EM risk premia. There's also a new paper that came out this week from Simon Gilchrist and co-authors. Um, the supply chain driven inflation pressures uh, that everyone is facing, will be a challenging factor for emerging markets. Uh, failing to tighten monetary policy could erode hard won credibility, but um, could also be contractionary. Uh, uh, many emerging markets are uh, already beginning to tighten. Uh, the Central Bank of Chile 
has hiked recently as the peso has depreciated. And this is more in line with the, uh, the uh, more um, typical responses seen in the past. Next slide, please. Uh, we need badly to enhance the financial system's resilience. And um, the crisis exposed a number of uh, stress lines. Um, the regulation of non-bank financial institutions is a big one. Uh, the tighter regulation of banks that rightly came out of the global financial crisis has driven a lot more activity into less regulated non-bank sectors. These sectors play a huge role in capital flows to emerging markets. Um, uh, problems in these sectors would be problematic for emerging markets and the world economy. We also saw, going back to those charts of the US uh, capital account I showed you, um, tremendous turmoil in March, 2020, in the market for US treasuries. And given the, the, the centrality of the dollar in global finance, not only in reserves, but as a funding currency, um, any problem in the US treasury market is a globally systemic problem for the global monetary system. So uh, there are a number of proposals for reform here. Central counterparties, for example, <coughs> excuse me, these need to be looked at. The global financial safety net uh, could be enhanced. Uh, the 16th review of IMF quotas is coming up. The fund needs more resources. Uh, the fund has still not really solved the problem of uh, liquidity lines, new liquidity swaps that were set up uh, for the crisis. They were actually rejected by the board before the crisis in 2017. They were set up during the crisis, have exactly zero take up from uh, fund members, members. So the problems with these swap lines uh, of stigma uh, and the like remain. And um, unlike the Fed's swap lines, uh, which only have gone to a very limited range of emerging markets, uh, and there I am, you know, maybe should not include uh, Korea and Singapore. Uh, uh, these, these really um, should be the model of what we should try to be doing. Um, capital flow measures need to be rethought. Uh, the fund has very usefully um, pushed an integrated policy approach that considers capital flow measures on uh, an even plane with monetary, uh, macro prudential, um, uh, FX intervention policies. These are symbiotic and complementary. Uh, this is something we should need to be thinking about, continuing to think about harder. And the fund is rethinking its institutional view. Um, if liquidity problems morph for some countries into solvency problems, uh, the inadequacies of the sovereign debt restructuring framework will come more sharply into view. Um, the G20 during the crisis set up a common framework for um, debt resolution, uh, debt treatments beyond the uh, DSSI. Um, that is definite progress, but um, to the extent it makes private sector involvement uh, completely voluntary, um, it's not gonna go terribly far. And I think the crisis has shown us that exchange rate flexibility remains essential. Um, it may be that uh, after initial depreciations, as in the case of Chile, uh, currencies appreciated, but the need to defend fixed exchange rates in the short run without exploiting that extra degree of flexibility, I think would have been very difficult for central banks, uh, uh, there was really no need to stake credibility on a fixed exchange rate. Um, it's better, much better staked on an inflation target over time. So a famous golfer once said that um, golf is a game of luck. And the more I practice, the luckier I am. <laughs>
Similarly, macro policy success in this crisis has required luck, but the more we prepare, the luckier we are likely to be in the future. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Maurice. Very nice presentation. Um, do we have any questions? I, I, I don't see any questions yet, but um, just one short comment and perhaps uh, we can go from there. It's uh, one thing that we have seen is a very dramatic response, as you mentioned, from fiscal monetary authorities to the COVID. Um, even though perhaps fiscal has not been as bad as it seems in terms of the size of the shocks, uh, we, we are now beginning to face the, 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 the withdrawal of the monetary shocks and the dangers of uh, uh, rising interest rate at the time when the, the, the recovery doesn't look so strong, in, in, especially going into 2022 and 23. So how do you see that uh, proceeding? It's, it's something that uh, it's very much in, 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 in our, uh, let's say, <clears throat> in our discussions nowadays. Yeah, I, I mean, I, to I totally agree with you there. Um, I think the, uh, one, one factor is the, um, you know, just the, the path of the disease, which remains very, um, very uncertain. I mean, the pandemic keeps um, moving in surges and I think it, it moves in yeah. surges in an unbalanced way across, across countries. I mean, Chile is a country that is heavily vaccinated, but still it's had it's, had, it's, had its issues. And so what we've learned with this Delta variant is that you, you really need an exceptionally high level of vaccination to, uh, to uh, keep it under control. And so um, this is a problem. I think different countries also have different health capacity to deal with surges. So this is, this is a threat that has not gone away and that uh, is gonna continue to, to um, loom over economic growth if only by increasing economic uncertainty. Yeah. Um, you know, at the same time, um, you know, people are, people are tired of lockdowns. And so there's this process of reopening across the world that has placed uh, incredible strains on supply chains. Uh, it's been good for commodity prices, which is a plus for Chile. Yes. But, um, but, um, it does, it does raise the pressure on central banks to um, maintain credibility. And here I think the challenge is, is likely to be higher for emerging market central banks to, uh, to do that over time. So this, this story we're seeing play out in the US I think is playing out to different degrees elsewhere. Although though in the US, um, there's also the, the pressure of, of exceptional um, waves of um, a fiscal stimulus. So, so we, we are coming into a phase of, of harsh trade-off and we shouldn't, we shouldn't discount the, um, the political risks. I mean, if you look at um, Europe and you look at Rotterdam and you look at Belgium and you look mm -hmm. at Austria, um, you know, you see, you see uh, you know, real, real social tensions which, uh, you know, at an early phase of the pandemic, uh, let's say summer of 2020, you would have said, well, Europe's doing really well. But the, the, the sheer persistence of this thing uh, has, been, uh, has been quite problematic and has been, I think, politically destabilizing. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the extent of vaccine uh, resistance, has certainly surprised me. Although if you read history, it's actually, um, it's been pretty, a pretty constant thing since the, the 60s. And part of the reason that it rose in the 60s was um, uh, a, a sort of growing distrust of, um, of institutions. And to the extent that 
you know, there is around the world, um, and this is, I think, one legacy of the global financial crisis, uh, more distrust in, in government and in government institutions. Yeah. It also is um, problematic for this, this, this political environment. So, you know, this, this, this distrust is, is, you know, gonna, gonna extend to central banks. It does extend to central banks, unfortunately. So the, the challenges are great and it, it, it does place a great premium on, um, you know, transparency, communication, and just recognizing that, um, you know, it's critical for central banks to, to remain, um, uh, you know, what, they, what, they, what they've tried to become, uh, you know, independent and credible. Yeah. We have a question from Shabnam. Um, Hi, Shabnam. Shabnam. Okay, yes, so I, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> uh, Mr. <laughs> also, I, I worry that excellent, excellent <laughs> keynote. Thank, thank you so much for being here and um, uh, providing us all these insights. So I have a question on this whole uh, stigma with the IMF uh, swap line and the, the US Federal Reserve uh, emergency liquidity measure. I mean, so, I mean, do you think we are now in a world where U.S. Federal Reserve and ECB, to a certain extent, matters more for emerging markets than the IMF. I mean, what? I mean, in terms of these type of like super uncertain, big crisis, COVID, that emergency liquidity help. I mean, comes really from the U.S. Federal Reserve, right? I mean, with the soft lines and then the whole expansion of monetary policy. Well, why this is the case? I and mean, at least for emerging markets, maybe poorer developing countries, IMF is still important. But what, why this is the case? So, so well, what is the stigma is about, and why? Why you know? So kind of Federal Reserve took over in terms of uh, help during this type of crisis. You well, know? yeah, as you know, as you know, Shetnam, that the original vision Keynes had of the IMF was basically an institution that would issue a global currency and. Um, uh, regulate global liquidity, and but the IMF that that was created is one that um, you know has limited resources and it can alleviate li liquidity problems for individual countries subject to conditionality. In most cases, not in all cases, because there are you know some some newer facilities which are conditionality light, but the the. You know, the, the, even with the creation of the SDR, uh, which has helped the, the, the funds tools for, for glo enhancing global liquidity are quite limited. So, the, you know, the action that the, uh, uh, the fund took supported by the Biden administration to issue um, uh, $650 billion in SDRs, that was, you know, very, very worthwhile, but you know, at some level, it doesn't it doesn't increase global liquidity. It increases, you know, the allo the, the ease of allocation of global liquidity. It sends global liquidity to where it is most needed, but it, its effect on overall global liquidity is 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 minimal. So that sort of leaves us with the um, you know the issuers of the true global currencies, and at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Those are uh, the U.S. and the ECB. You know, we can we can talk about where China is in that process, and uh, uh, some smaller um, advanced economies. But uh, you know, mostly mostly the U.S. The dollar is the world's currency, and the U.S. is the regulator of global liquidity. Uh, uh, quite unlike um, Keynes's. Uh, Keynes's original view, and um, you know, interestingly, the um, that was sort of that was more or less obviously the case in um, the Bretton Woods system because of the way the exchange rate system was set up. But it stayed the case despite the move to floating exchange rates. So we still live in a very asymmetric system where the U.S., despite its declining absolute size in the world economy, uh, is um, you know, far and away the most powerful issuer of liquidity.
Sorry. Um, we have another question from Helen Ray this time. Hi, Helen. Hi, Maury. <laughs> Very nice to see you. Um, you yes. So, <laughs> um, so uh, we, uh, there's liquidity on, uh, on, on one side and uh, the role of the IMF and the role of, uh, of uh, the Fed, etc. But then there's also this uh, perennial question on uh, the capital flows flowing where they should be flowing. Um, and uh, this is uh, an extremely important question in the coming uh, years because uh, we uh, have to make sure that the green transition is happening. Uh, and that involves in particular that there's a lot of uh, financing flows that have to be uh, going towards um, emerging markets uh, who are, uh, you know, large carbon issuers, uh, but uh, cannot necessarily finance uh, their transition by themselves. So uh, do you see a role for the, uh, for the IMF as um, a kind of de-risking uh, agent? Uh, so some kind of uh, hybrid um, uh, structured finance here with some uh, intermediation of capital flows from uh, international investors, asset managers, etc. But uh, some role of uh, first loss or uh, de-risking function by, uh, by the IMF, or is it something that should not really be done at all by the fund and uh, should more, be more something done by the, by the World Bank? How do you see the the kind of financial engineering in the international financial system that could allow for the capital to flow where it needs to flow if we want to, uh, to do the green transition. Um, so do you, do you have any views on that? Yeah, I mean, we are, we are at, a, at, a, at a critical moment. Um, you know, as Nick Stern and others have pointed out, because um, we don't want emerging markets with infrastructure needs to get locked into fossil fuel intensive technologies. Um, there is a problem of network externalities in um, avoiding that because of the complementarities among different investment projects. And so I, I don't think that these are problems that can get easily solved by the market. And then there is the, the, the problem you raise of financing. Uh, these sorts of investments uh, because um, more resources are gonna be needed uh, and some subsidy element is gonna be needed. Um, you know, COP26 failed again to, uh, you know, cough up the money that is, that is needed for this. So, I, you know, I think, I think the issues you raise of, um, you know, there, there are issues of subsidization, there are issues of, bringing in the private sector as a partner, which requires some guarantees. Uh, you know, any, anything you do is gonna cost money and it's gonna have to be put on the table by rich countries. And you can structure it so that, you know, it goes through the bank or goes through the fund or goes through some new G20 facility or bilaterally, but, Basically, um, you know, until until, you know, so 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 it may be that the the, the relevant issue is the is the political issue, you know. Do you want to? Um, how, how can you how can you package this in a way that it's politically palatable for legislatures in advanced economies? I'm not sure how you do that, but um, uh, cl clearly there there's a need for advanced economies to step up, for the for the public sector to step in. Uh, because this isn't going to happen happen on its own. Um, you know what? Is, what is the best way to structure it? Is um, you know, going to be a question of uh, of efficiency, uh, efficacy, but I think also of politics. And um, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I think it's something we should think about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Maurice. Um, I think. We, we, I don't see uh, more questions, so and we are very close to the the closing time. So perhaps we can stop here, unless you want to, to have some final words, uh, Maurice. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, I don't I don't have final words of wisdom. I think um, <laughs> you know, this is a this is a uh, I'm, I'm sort of used up my stock of wisdom for this morning, but. 
Um, you know, the, looking through the conference schedule, I think this is really, you know, this has been a fantastic conference series. When I see the Roman numerals 24 Central Bank Conference, I think of the Super Bowl. You know, there are more Super Bowls, but, you know, I know you guys will keep going. And, but, but this, this conference today, I think, stands out in terms of the relevance and the, the quality of the papers. Um, you know, it's really hitting the really important and key issues that we're facing. So, you know, I just want to congratulate the, uh, the CBC and the organizers on putting this together. And, um, um, you know, I'm sorry I can't personally attend more of this today. It's not voluntary, but um, uh, I, will, I will very much look forward to um, looking over everything uh, retroactively. So thank you. Now we are seeing a, a few questions coming in. <laughs> we have one by Georgia Bush. Could you please elaborate on the U.S. Treasury market role in systemic risks and how do we see reforms proceeding? Yeah, um, you know, in in March um, we saw the amazing uh, what was called the dash for cash that. Um, uh, 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 even though treasuries are supposed to be the most liquid bond in the world, people were having troubles turning them into cash in thin markets. Um, uh, the feds uh, set up a special facility for uh, foreign monetary agencies uh, to repo their, um, uh, their treasuries. Uh, so the fact that that was necessary indicated that, um, you know, even international reserves are not the um, perfect hedge that central banks thought they were because the basic idea is that you hold these treasury bonds in a crisis, the dollar appreciates, uh, treasury yields fall, the bonds appreciate, it's a really good insurance hedge but then if you, if you can't sell the things at, at the market prices that would be customary, it becomes problematic. So, um, you know, this, this led to um, uh, attention to the plumbing of the treasury market, which is quite outdated. And there've been a number of studies. There's a Brookings study that Don Cohen led uh, together with Anil Kashyap. There is a, uh, group of 30 paper by a number of worthies, including uh, Mervyn King, Larry Summers, you know, Bill Dudley, Axel Weber. Um, uh, Daryl Duffy has a great paper for Brookings, all suggesting ways in which treasury plumbing could be improved. The, ma the main commonality, I think, is to set up um, central clearing to um, reduce risk and improve liquidity in the treasury market. Uh, but, um, you know, as I said, we, we should think of the treasury market as not something that is inherent to the U.S. only. It is an integral part of the global monetary system. 